Let's pray together to return to God's word. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true and trustworthy and that it continues to speak even as it did when it was first spoken. And so we ask you, Lord, to open up our hearts, our minds, our ears to hear from you and to see you and be transformed by you, Holy Spirit, as you speak. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, we are just uh, hours away from celebrating New Year's Eve, from turning the calendar from one year to the next. And as we do that, I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about your New Year's Eve party plans. And I know you've already talked about that with each other. And some of you have uh, small, quiet plans. And some of you maybe have larger, bigger plans. But a plan really for New Year's Eve revolves around the time. What time are we going to get together? And then the people, who's going to be there and then the, the plan, what is it that we're going to do? So it's the, the when and the who and the what, okay? That's kind of what comes together to make the plan. So you have big plans. Uh, maybe you're going to start uh, with a brunch after church, and then you're going to meet up with some people after that, and then, you know, 9, 10 o'clock, that's when the party will really get going, and you're not going to shut this down until 2 a.m. as you ring in the new year with all sorts of people and fireworks and all the rest of it. And some of you have different plans. Your plan is around 8.30 to brush your teeth, okay, and around 9 o'clock it'll be you and your pillow, okay, and by 9.30, lights out well before any fireworks start crackling, okay? That might be your plan as well, and both plans are good plans, okay? Bo both plans are good, but they still revolve around the same types of things, the when and the who and the what, as we spend time thinking about Christmas and about New Year's and the time, I want to talk about God's party plan, okay? And I want to talk about His timing and the who and the what. And we're going to do that by looking at Galatians 4, just a brief section of it. And so we'll have that up on the screen and take a look at that. It says this, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the said time had fully come, God sent His Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now let's talk about the timing first. Okay, that's where it starts, when uh, the set time had fully come. How many of you are people who are always on time? Any of those people here? Yes, th these are my people, okay? And how many of you are always late? Yes, somehow uh, an on-timer and a later often marry each other. And there's this endless struggle, right? Who's going to get their way? It's always the people who are late, right? There's no way of shifting that. It's just how it goes. Think about time from God's perspective for a minute. Where does God fall in relation to time? Over it. God is the one who created time. And we see that, uh, Genesis 1, 1, okay, in the beginning, God's already there at the very start. And if we go to the next verse, it says this, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. That's the creation of time. And suddenly this, this uh, ebb and flow of time of night and day and night and day, this cycle that goes on and on and on uh, begins and has continued all through time. But God exists outside of time. But before time, he, he eclipses time. He supersedes time. We have different devices to keep track of time. I had my a cell phone before with timers. We have clocks and analog clocks. We have to change the batteries and digital clocks. You know, maybe the plug in or run on a battery as well. Some of you maybe in your houses, this is true in our house, you go through different time zones as you go through the house, right? The bedroom clock is a different time than the bathroom clock, different time than the kitchen clock. You're traveling through time, but we really have no control over time. Time keeps going. You can't pause it. You can't rewind it. You can't fast forward it, even though often when you're younger, you're wishing you could fast forward, right? And as you get older, you're wishing you could rewind or maybe you have kids, you wish you could pause right at a certain point. Oh, they're, it's so great right now. I wish I could just hit pause. But you can't because time just keeps on marching on. There's a significant difference between us and God, many of them. But one of them is God rules over time and we are ruled by time. No control over it at all as much as we wish that we could or have that control. 
Galatians 4 up there, if we go a slide again, says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. The set time had fully come. God here had, had a timing in mind, had a set time when Jesus would come. I don't know if you've thought about that before. This wasn't random where God was like, okay, well, now seems like a pretty good time. And maybe you've wondered about that time. Why didn't God send Jesus earlier in time? Like, what about Adam and Eve sin in the garden? And Jesus is like, okay, I'm here. I saved the day. Like, that would seem like pretty good timing. Or what if before Adam and Eve sinned, he showed up and was like, no, 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 no. Don't touch that fruit. That's going to cause a lot of trouble for a lot of people. What if he did that? Or what if Jesus, instead of coming 2,000 years ago, came now? I mean, this would be a good time because it could be live streamed, right? The announcement to Mary right up on the jumbotron interrupting all of our news channels and live streams there's the birth we could live stream the whole thing yes this is the savior like now would seem like a good time so what was it about that time where god said this is the time in advance of the time coming he had planned out that would be the point in history the time when jesus would come We don't know for sure why. We don't know for sure why God chose that time. There are a number of uh, reasons that make it seem like a good time. One of them is that uh, the Jewish nation at that point in time was longing for the Messiah to come. Right? They're being ruled by Rome. And we see that when John the Baptist comes on the scene. And the question they ask him is, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? We've been waiting. We're looking forward to him coming. Could you be the one? So maybe because there was some anticipation that had built up around the Savior coming. There's also a lot of things that the Roman Empire were, were doing that created it to be a good time, maybe, uh, for them to come. For example, they had built four, imagine this, 400,000 kilometers of roads. Some of those roads are still here today. Think about our roads. Like a year from now, Highway 1 could all be gone, right? I mean, our roads are not nearly as enduring. 400,000 kilometers of roads, so it was easy to travel, It was also at this point in time a peaceful time. Rome had conquered all of its enemies, more or less. It was peaceful. The the Roman peace, it was called. So you could travel everywhere, and it was peaceful to travel. Not only that, but Greek was the common language all over the place. You could go anywhere on those roads and speak just one language. So that made it a good time. It was peaceful. It was easy to travel. It was easy to communicate. They had a postal system you could use. There's all these things that we see Paul take advantage of to spread the gospel really quickly. Maybe not as quickly as an email, right, or a website could do it, but pretty efficiently for that time. And maybe those are some of the reasons God said, this will be the time that I had come. We don't know for sure why, But God had chosen a time, and the time was now. The time was ready. The time was ripe. And so he puts his plan into motion. Time's a phenomenal gift. I I don't know if you could think of a more significant gift. You could have all the money in the world, but if you have no time, your money's useless, right? Or you could be the most popular person, most famous person in the world, but once you die, you're just a dead person who used to be Famous, right? I mean, I don't know what you could have where it, where it endures past your time running out. And an interesting thing about the gift of time is we all have it, but none of us has any idea how much we have left of it, right? Our friend, many of you would know Vicki Jenkins, 99, she could outlive all of us, right? We have no idea. I mean, I don't anticipate that will happen, but we have no idea how much time any of us has left in the bank, a phenomenal gift, but a gift that has a finite ending, an unknown ending for each of us. Maybe a question to ask right now is, how well are you using the gift that you've been given? How well are you using the gift of time that God has given to you right now? Or is the time ripe for you to make a change? Not because it's New Year's, although that might be a good enough reason, but because God has given you this gift of time and surely you don't want to waste the unknown amount of time you have left. That's the time. Let's uh, look at the next part. When, God, when the, the time, set time had fully come, God sent his son. So we've talked about the timing. Now we're going to talk about the who. Just like you have party plans, or maybe you don't, of who you're going to hang out with, God had a, a set timing for when he would send his son. And it's an interesting phrase, isn't it? At the set time, 
God sent his son. A lot of people think that Jesus was a good person or a good teacher or a good leader, and they take away the the idea that he was God, which really makes Jesus a a useless historical figure. But they, they look at this verse. It's an interesting phrase that God sent his son. It doesn't say at the, when the set time had fully come, uh, God created his son, right? Or a son was born, but God sent his son. When Ren and I decided we wanted to start a family, I didn't say to her, I will send forth a son, right? Some proclamation. I had no control. I had no control over uh, if we could become pregnant or when that might happen, really, or if it would be a boy or a girl or any of those things, right? I mean, really, it's up to God's uh, mercy and goodness and grace, right? I, I cannot pronounce it and then speak it into being, but here we hear, see God saying, I will send forth my son, which gives us a, a hint at, a clue at the preexistence of Jesus, that Jesus wasn't just suddenly created, but that Jesus had existed before, that God the Father and God the Son were already together in heaven. And then at this point, Jesus and the Father agree, now is the time for me to go, right? This is the time we've been waiting for. Now I'll go. And there's lots of Bible verses about, uh, that points to that. One that's often read at Christmas is from John 1, and it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that had been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Talking about the pre-existence of Jesus, that Jesus has always been and has always been God and was with God the Father. And then at this point in time, comes forth, right? Is born. It's through the Holy Spirit. It's conceived in Mary to step into history and onto earth. Another simpler verse, if that one seems confusing, from John 17 is a really simple one. This is Jesus speaking. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus isn't suddenly born or created at Christmas. He's always been. But at this point, at this time, the who is Jesus. Jesus comes. God the Son comes to earth for us. How about you? Who are you spending your time with? You've got this gift of time. Who's the who? Who will you spend your time with? Will they be people who detract away, who pull away from you in your relationship with God? Are they people who will spur you on in your relationship with God? Uh, What will that look like? Who's the who that you're going to spend this new year and as much time as God has given to you with? Let's look at Galatians 4 again. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Those are odd things to say, aren't they? Born of a woman. If I was, again, introducing my children, would I say to you, this is Silas, born of a woman? Weird. (laughs) Isn't that be a weird thing to say? Quick poll, how many of you were born of a woman? Aha, okay, (laughs) interesting. These unifying things we all share in common. We're all born of women, right? Born of a woman. Why would it say that to us? Why why would Paul think, this is important for me to write, Jesus, born of a woman? Why? Why is that significant? It's significant for a couple reasons. One reason is it points us to the humanity of Jesus. We're talking about this God coming from heaven to earth but not coming only as God, but coming as one of us, conceived and born of a woman. It's so important that it's in all of our creeds, right? Uh, That that he was conceived by the Virgin Mary, right? That, That this idea of God being God eternal, Jesus being eternal God, but also being human, wrapped in flesh, that he became one of us. That's significant for us. born of a woman, but it doesn't mention a man, right? Because as much as Joseph is the father of Jesus, he's not biologically connected at all. This is God. This is someone, something different. In the incarnation, a brand new thing begins. And it's Jesus, both God and man, come for us. 
We'll talk more about that in a minute. The next phrase that's interesting here is born under the law, right? Why is that significant for us? Well, it points us to the fact that Jesus is Jewish, okay? And these were people of the law. They were under the law of Moses, uh, which is God's law for them, the Ten Commandments, but also more than that. And so Jesus comes under the law. And what's significant is that everyone born under the law had broken the law. Jesus comes under the law as well, but he will be, because he's both God and man, the one who fulfills the law, the one who never breaks it, the the one who uh, always, always lives and acts and behaves in accordance with and agreement with the law. God's timing, God's son, which brings us to the last point, God's purpose or God's plan. What was the plan in sending Jesus? But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. God's person, uh, purpose was to redeem those under the law and adopt them. Here's the problem with the law, the law that Jesus was also born under. Nobody could keep it, not a single person, not once. Nobody could do it. Here's a question. How many of you, by a show of hands, have broken a Canadian law? Yeah, okay. We will be making no arrests, okay? You, you all can go free. We, we've broke, whether we're aware of it or not, we probably have, right? We're jaywalking or we're speeding a little bit in the zone or whatever, we're double parked or parking without paying. We're breaking laws as we go. And for all Canadian laws, there's some type of consequence. The challenge is, here's, here's another question. How many of you have broken a law and gotten away with it? Yeah, Okay. See, there's this breakdown where you can break a law, but if nobody catches you, you get to go free, right? There's no consequence to the law. And we take that idea in our minds and try and apply it to God and God's law. I broke the law, but nobody saw me. I broke God's law, but nobody found out. So I guess I'm good. We're good, right? And we have this idea, except that God catches us every single time. God sees us every single time. We apply this idea that, well, the police didn't see it and catch me, and we apply it to God, but it doesn't work. That, that uh, metaphor, that connection breaks down because God is the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God. He didn't miss it when you sinned. He, he didn't, it wasn't distracted with something else. God always sees everything all the time, and he's seen you, and he's seen me when we've broken his law, and all of us, now deserve the consequence. Just like every Canadian law has a consequence, every law of God's has a consequence. And when we break it, we're guilty of the law and deserving of the punishment for the crime. And this is God's plan. With his timing and with the sending of his son, the plan is up here that he would redeem those under the law, that he would rescue those under the law, that he would pay the penalty for those under the law the law. And that's where the humanity and the divinity of Jesus being united in him in the incarnation becomes so significant. Because maybe I could say to God, um, Jill has been a really great person, great friend of mine. I will die for her sins. Be pretty nice to me, hey, Jill? Except that it would be meaningless because I can't. I can't even pay for my own sins. How can I attempt to pay for anyone else's? So if Jesus was just a nice guy, nice teacher, a nice guy from Bethlehem, and he died for us, it would be totally irrelevant. A wasted life because it would have no meaning and no value. But because he's also God, the sacrifice he makes is so fantastic, so enormous, so outstanding, so great, that his sacrifice is more than enough to cover all of our sins. When John sees him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he means it. All the sins are paid for in full in that one moment in time where Jesus dies on the cross for us. Martin Luther said, The manger and the cross are never far apart. They're both part of the same plan. And we see it here when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, pointing us to the manger, born under the law, pointing to his, uh, his ethnicity, to redeem those under the law, that's everyone else, that we might receive sonship. Adoption to sonship. 
That's the why. Why does he do all this? To rescue us and to adopt us into his family. Those who are cut off, those who are separated, those who uh, could never be in a relationship with God on our own, only ever deserving the wrath of God. Jesus changes that and brings us into the family of God. You have earthly parents here, but if you believe in Jesus, then you have a heavenly Father who lives and rules and reigns over all things for all of time. First John, I don't have it up on the screen, but it says, look at how God loves us, that we should be called the children of God. Isn't that just a phenomenal passage that God looks at us and says, that's my son, that's my daughter, you're mine. Just like a parent, just doting on their children. That's God the Father up in heaven as he looks down on us. Through Jesus, God forgives you and adopts you as his own. And church, I can say with all sincerity, I like you guys. Would I adopt all of you and bring you up to my house? No. No. First of all, Ken and Tom would have to build me a much bigger house, right? That's not, that's not going to happen. But, but there, there's this breakdown, right, of where, where we like each other, we have, we're in a relationship with each other, maybe even you love one another, but to adopt someone is such a significant step, such a beautiful, powerful thing where you say, everything I have is yours now. I, I will bring you under my roof and my shelter and my care and I'll provide for you and I'll watch over you and, and I'll, I'll do whatever it is you need me to do to cover over you and provide for you. God has done that for each and every one of us because of his son. That's God's timing and that's God's who in sending his son Jesus and that's God's plan and purpose in and for us. I don't know what your plans are for New Year's Eve. Uh, I don't know what your hopes or expectations are for this coming year. I don't know if, it's, if you're looking forward to saying, yes, this is going to be great, or if you're looking saying, man, I'm dragging all these challenges from 2023 into 2024 with me. You can already see them there. But I do know that God has a purpose and a plan for this time that he's given to you through the gift of his son that he sent for you and for the forgiveness and grace that he's won and paid for for you I'm sure a lot of you gave gifts for Christmas. Here's a question for you. How do you know if someone likes the gift that you gave them? How do you know if they like it? The, pardon me? They use it, okay? And they don't, they don't uh, imagine I give you a piano, okay? I know you do not like the gift if it just collects dust, right? You look at it and say, beautiful, but you never touch it. Then, then I know there's a disconnect in the gift. Or you say, this is beautiful, and you take a hammer and you start smashing it, right? Then I know that it was, you have not received the gift well, but if you sit down and you play and you play and you play and you play and you just delight in the gift. Well, God has given us a greater gift. It's the gift of time, and you don't know how much you have. So would, I, could I encourage you to use that gift well? And whether you get to keep on singing through 2024 and decades to come, or whether God calls you home before midnight strikes tonight, would you use the gift of time that God has given you to bring glory to his son that he sent for you? And would you use this time he's given you to spread the plan, the purpose that God has in sending his son to bring people into his family? Could I encourage you to pick, pick a time? When are you going to? Who, who are you going to tell this year? And what are you going to tell them? You don't have to tell them what an awful, evil, rotten person they are. You don't have to tell them how deserving of wrath and judgment they are. You could tell them instead about this almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God who loves so much, loves you so much that he came even in your sinfulness to rescue you and to bring you into his family and how that invitation extends to each and every one of them as well. Could you pick a who and would you decide on the time to do it? And then could you invite them into this beautiful, beautiful story? Let's pray together. Almighty, all-powerful God, who lives and rules and reigns over all things, who speaks into creation and sustains all things, God, we give you thanks today for your timing. We don't know why. We don't understand everything about um, how you operate with time or how you chose the time to send Jesus, but we give you praise and honor and thanks that you did send Jesus. As the Lamb of God who would take away every sin, as the 
sacrifice for us as the redeeming one and rescuing one. And God, we thank you that you have made yourself known to us, that you by your spirit and your word revealed yourself to us. So Lord, we pray that as you lead us by your spirit, Lord, help us to be courageous and bold. Give us wisdom and discernment. Lord, give us an urgency now to share this story, the true account of your son who lived and died and rose again for us. Give us the urgency to share that. May that be the story on our hearts and lips and minds and tongues as we step into a new year. And may we use this gift of time you've given us. May we use it well, Lord, for your glory and for your kingdom. And God, you tell us there's a time for everything. We pray that now would be a time for healing where there's division and hurt and sickness. Lord, we pray that now would be a time for building up for building up new relationships and building up new ministries and building one another up. Lord, we pray that now would be a time for laughing and dancing as we see the goodness, the faithfulness that you've poured out on us. Lord, we pray that now would be a time for embracing and reconciling. Lord, if there's division in our families, division in our relationships, division in our marriages, division in our, uh, between parents and children, Lord, we pray for reconciliation there. Lord, we pray that now would be a time for us to be bold and to speak words of life and truth to those who don't know you yet. That now would be a time for love and that that would increase in all areas of our lives. And Lord, we know that our world is full of division and conflict and war. And so we pray that now would be a time for peace. And most of all, Lord, we pray that now would be a time of growth in your kingdom, in faith around the world as people would see you and put their trust in you and believe in you and receive forgiveness from you. Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds today, we commit all those things to you, trusting in your son Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand as we speak the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I lead in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.